Hello, Vinyl Community. Uh, it's Wednesday, the <clears throat> check the date. Wednesday, the sixteenth of March, two thousand and sixteen. Vinyl Professor <clears throat> back with another another video. Um, I've been enjoying lots of other people's uh, stuff. Just going to turn the music down. Been enjoying lots of other people's films. On now on YouTube, Hi to Gideon Strumpet, really interesting uh, c collector doing lots of really good stuff on uh, Italian soundtracks, horror soundtracks. Quick mention to um, Dean Everest, who I accidentally referred to as Dean Everett last time. Heavy metal collector, some really interesting films there. And um, I've just been watching all these various things and it kind of got me thinking, you know, there's lots of people showing, you know, favourite records, records which, you know, mean a lot to them. Um, but I haven't seen anybody yet look at the concept of the comfort record. Uh, this is quite a big thing for me. The idea that there are some records which uh, are a bit like comfort blankets. They're the ones that you go to, perhaps when you're feeling a bit down, a bit sad. Or they're the ones you go to on a kind of cold winter's night when you've got a cup of tea and the dog at your feet and you just want to listen to something that just reminds you of good times in your life, maybe childhood memories, parts of your life where you know you were particularly happy or you have great associations. And that got me thinking, you know, these these kind of records, sometimes they can be a little bit embarrassing or they can be a little bit like, you know, skeletons in the closet. People have this expression, um, guilty secrets, don't they? Or gu guilty pleasures. And um, I started to compile my own list of some of these records, these comfort blanket records, and it was interesting because there are some, some of these records are what you might describe as, you know, critically acclaimed, cool, they're the kind of albums that, you know, I would make a film of and I would talk about them as being great records anyway. And some of them are not that at all, you know, some of them are okay, some of them are, you know, all right. So, and, you know, there are some which you could, you could possibly class as guilty pleasures. <clears throat> so it's not so much to do with the greatness of the music or otherwise, it's more to do with how these records make you feel and the kind of associations that you have with them. Here's a great example. The Buggles, The Age of Plastic, this came out, I think, in about 1979. 1980, I'm not too sure. I'll do a feature on this at a later date. I actually have the other Buggles album as well, Adventures in Modern Recording. You know, a great pair of albums, really. I mean, I'm not sure if you could sort of describe them as being all-time classics, although I think there is a case to be made for this one, quite kind of influential. But this one, you know, contains Video Killed the Radio Star. It just has some really lovely songs on it, you know, L Street, Astro Boy and the Pearls on Parade. Um, I Love You Miss Robot, it just, it kind of reminds me of a time in my life, I think I was probably about 9 or 10, and I used to listen to it on my dad's hi-fi at home, and it's just a very kind of, um, a very rich and melodic record, always makes me feel good to listen to it. I should just say that I put these records into a random order, so I have no idea what's going to come up next, and I'm just seeing what the next one is. Kiss, Killers. I was quite into Kiss when I was a teenager. This was the first album I bought, and it's kind of a good job that I bought this one. If I bought one of the other ones, say Creatures of the Night, which is a very sort of heavy, pumping metal record, I'm not sure if I would have pursued Kiss any further, because I was quite young when I bought this. I was probably about 12, and I was, I was quite into my pop stuff. And this album, it, it has a few rock things on it, but it, it's, it, but it also displays Kiss's very strong, melodic pop side which I think came out towards the end of the 1970s when they went disco, you know. So it contains stuff like um, Sure Knows Something, you know, I mean, not a great Kiss track in terms of Kiss being this kind of like heavy metal legend, but just a really nice melodic song. And the reason that I, I feel quite warm towards this record is, 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 is that there are some songs here that my mum used to enjoy. My mum used to do the ironing outside my bedroom door and I would have, I'd, I'd be playing records in my room and when Sure Know Something came on, she would always say, Ooh, I like that one. That's a good one. So, 
Always nice if you can share records with people who don't normally like your records. Wings, London Town. My copy here is signed by Denny Lane, who I met at um, a Denny Lane gig a few years ago. The first McCartney album that I actually owned myself, my dad had band on the run and we used to listen to that on his hi-fi downstairs. When this came out in 1978, my parents bought it for me and I just used to sit in my room and just listen to it all day. Um, I seem to remember I used to love it up until about halfway down side two and then I didn't, I, I never liked to come the last three or four tracks so I would always kind of sit through those, get a bit bored and then I'd queue up side one again and go straight through again. I mean, Paul McCartney and Wings, you know, were a huge part of my childhood, and uh, you can't get much more of a comfort blanket album than this. This one, very similar, ELO, Discovery. I actually bought this for my father. <laughs> he didn't like pop music, but he used to sort of half pretend to like some things, and I think it was Don't Bring Me Down came out, and he said he liked it, so I bought him this for his birthday, and we used to listen to it together. We used to, I think we used to listen to this we used to light the fire in the living room. For some reason I just have associations with sitting down in front of a sort of roaring fire on a winter's night and listening to that album, ELO Discovery. So from the not very cool at all to the possibly more cool, Talking Heads 77. This is from a completely different part of my life. It was probably when I was in my mid-twenties and I was just, I was living a really kind of good life in a way. I was, you know, I had no job, I had no girlfriend, I had no partner, but I had a great circle of friends and I was playing in bands and, um, you know, indulging in various things and just enjoying myself and just living a kind of great kind of life, you know, um, no responsibilities. And this album takes me back to those days, really. Living in near squalor, but just having a great time, you know, playing the drums, playing gigs, doing comedy stuff, and just having a great time with my mates. Talking Heads takes me back to those days. I'll be doing a feature on this at a later date. Pink Floyd, a nice pair. This is the first, their first two albums compiled together into a double set. It does have a gatefold. I won't show it now. I'll show it at a later date when I do a feature. This was the... The first Pink Floyd album I, I had, and it just reminds me of being in my bedroom at home at my parents' house in the dark in winter, listening to it. I think Source of Full of Secrets, the second album actually, I'm, I'm slightly more fond of, even though I think you'd be hard pressed to make a case for it being a better album than Piper at the Gates of Dawn, but Source of Full of Secrets to me was always, it's, it, it was kind of a bit more mysterious sounding, and um, you, you know, you could just lose yourself in it, escape into it. And we, so here we have a bona fide, you know, absolute classic. Um, so an example of an album which is a comfort blanket album to me personally, but which is, of course, obviously one of the great albums of all time. I kind of had a spiritual awakening to this album in my mid-twenties. It was during a strange time in my life when I was, I was kind of happy, but I was also starting to confront certain things, you know, starting to confront the idea that, you know, one day my parents will not be here anymore just confronting these kind of things, you know, mortality and just sort of, you know, wondering what, you know, what's life all about. I seem to remember I was reading a lot of stuff, you know, Buddhist books and texts and I was starting to get interested in meditation and looking for the meaning of life. And, you know, this album is a great soundtrack to that kind of spiritual uh, exploration. And Marvin Gaye is still, I think, you know, the greatest singer of all time. He is my favourite singer by far. John Cale. Paris 19. This kind of reminds me of the first few years of my son, my son's life, and I used to I used to walk around the streets pushing the push chair, listening to this on my iPod. Lovely album, lovely arrangements, very melodic. Queen 2. Bought this when I was about probably I was about um, 11 or 12. This kind of reminds me of that that slightly strange period that you go through just before becoming a teenager, you know. Being a kid is great, it's very straightforward, you're playing out, you're having a great time with your mates. Being a teenager is very different, uh, you know, it's full of strange anxieties and strange things going on, you know, and this this album takes me back to, there was a, a really rich period just before all that struck and I was reaching the end of my boyhood 
And I seem to remember listening to this, and it actually used to make me cry. I think I think the track, The White Queen, because I think I just used to think to myself, yeah, I'm, I'm at that point now where I'm saying goodbye to my childhood, and I'm about to move on. And that's what this album makes me think of. Squeeze, Argy Bargy, signed copy, Chris Difford. Squeeze were a big, played a massive part in my life, and I'll do a feature on them later. This album always reminds me of summer, being at home, uh, having the tent up in the back garden, having my friends around, listening to it all day, fantasising I was in the band, just absolute pure escapism, you know, really good British, um, almost a Britpop then, uh, you know, new wave. Squeeze, Argy Bargy, great album. 10CC, the original soundtrack, this actually takes me back to my earliest childhood. My dad had this record and I used to listen to it. They would have sort of, you know, parties or you know, evenings with their friends in the living room and we lived in this little tiny bungalow. So my bedroom would literally just be kind of right next to where the adults were. And I would hear this album being played and uh, it still kind of makes me think of home and family you know, warm feelings. Peter Gabriel, uh, the first solo album. I could have chosen So as well, because I, you know, I also love that album. But this one contains um, Salisbury Hill, which is just, it's just one of those songs. It's like if you walk into a room and it's cold and you light a fire in the room and get warm, you know, you can walk into a cold, dark room and put on Salisbury Hill and it's just like lighting a fire in the room, you know, it just warms the room up. It's such a warm, human song, um, you know, full of spiritual yearning. There's a story behind the song, which I'm sure you'll know, but I won't go into that now. But yeah, the first Peter Gabriel album, great 70s record, very nostalgic. This album was immensely important to me, The Shadows 20 Golden Greats. I used to run home from school on a winter's night and put this on. My, I, think it, I think my grandmother gave this to me as a present. And I just used to love all the song titles, you know, Man of Mystery, The Frightened City, uh, Genie with the Light Brown Lamp. I used to make up my own words to these uh, to these pieces of music because I, I used to love them as instrumentals, but I always used to think, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if these songs had words? So I just used to sit in my bedroom and sing along, you know, and just kind of make, you know, make up my own words. And the track Apache on here really, really takes me back to a very, very, very happy summer's day when I was a child, playing by the river with my friends. And the track Shindig, from years and years later, really reminds me of when I got together uh, with my partner and we were just starting out and everything was new and exciting, which it still is, of course. Prefab Sprout, Steve McQueen, I just, this kind of reminds me of a time in my life when perhaps I wasn't that happy, you know, things were kind of happening. I you know, problems with the relationship and, and uh, I think my, my grandmother died at about the same time. I was kind of in, in my early 20s, but I listen to it now, of course, at this stage in my life and I'm, I'm kind of happy and settled and everything's good and I kind of look through rose-tinted glasses, really, and I remember those days with fondness, even though perhaps, I, you know, at the time, I probably felt quite miserable. Great songwriter, Paddy McAloon, I'll do a feature on him, and this is a great album, you know, you just, you put it on and you're transported into another world. This one, um, Joe Jackson, uh, Night and Day, it comes from the same period of my life as the Talking Heads one. Just playing in bands, having a good time, having no responsibilities, and the track Stepping Out just always transports me back to those days, really. I could have picked Tubular Bells by Mike Oldfield, but I went for Omadorn because it's a more recent discovery and I, I just love playing this in the kitchen, sat at the kitchen table with my son, he's drawing or, you know, practicing his letters and, I, and I'm just sat next to him, perhaps, you know, drawing something as well and we, and we have this on in the background and it's just a great album to play on a kind of autumn afternoon when the day's stretching off in front of you and there's nothing much to do. Mike Oldfield, Omadorn. And finally, an album which I very rarely play, but I can't help, you know, when I think of this album, I just immediately get a warm glow. Jean-Michel Jarre, The Essential. My uncle had this, and um, I remember going to his house and him playing it for me, and I remember thinking, wow, this is great, this is something new, you know, totally different. And um, after I bought it, I listened to it a fair bit. I grew tired of it, actually, 
I think he's a bit one dimensional, a bit of a one trick pony perhaps, but I can still put this on now and I can feel happy and safe, you know. A comfort blanket album par excellence. And then just one honorary mention, because I don't have this on, on vinyl. This is Thomas Dolby, Astronauts and Heretics. Reminds me of being in my early 20s again, just left university, uh, starting out playing in bands and just having a good time. And uh, This is a really nice album, some really nice tunes. It's not his best album, but it's just, it's, it's just a nice one to stick on. You know, you just put it on and it just it smooths your day. And that concludes what may turn out to be just the first instalment of my favourite comfort blanket record. So I hope you enjoyed it. A big hello to all my subscribers. If you like this video, please give us a, um, a like down below and please subscribe. I'm trying to get as many subscribers as I can. Uh, and I'll be back soon with more uh, videos about records. So take care VC. I will see you all very soon. Bye.